Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm really excited to be welcoming Jeffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute here to talk today. Um, I think Jeffrey can probably tell you a lot more about the Santa Fe Institute than I can, but I'll just say that one of the hallmarks of the Santa Fe Institute is that it's an incredibly interdisciplinary place. And the work that Jeffrey's going to be talking about today really exemplifies that because he brings together threads from physics, from biology, and even from sociology. Uh, the, the work that Jeffrey's going to talk about has been incredibly influential. He's gotten some great write-ups. He was one of Time's 100 Most Influential People last year. He's gotten uh, write-ups in the Harvard Business Review and lots of other accolades for the work. So uh, I want to let him tell you all about it. So here he is, Jeff West. an absolute first at Google in that uh, I'm using 20th century technology, maybe not even 20th century. Uh, and apparently, it's, it's, so it may be a little bit, um, I'm not too sure how it's actually going to work. I've never used, I have used once one of these contraptions, but uh, I prefer even the old fashioned ones that don't digitalize. So. Anyway, so let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's really um, an attempt to address the question of are there fundamental laws of biology um, that can be put in a quantitative, mathematized, predictable language so that we can make biology into a science that is a little bit more like physics and chemistry where we can actually uh, analyze mathematically a given problem um, and then uh, from that make predictions and then start to have a major uh, conceptual framework. And of course, in biology, the problem is that uh, the system, as distinct from canonical physics uh, kinds of situations, um, involves huge numbers of agents at work, um, uh, highly complex phenomena, self-organization, uh, self emergent properties, <clears throat> pardon me, um, historical contingency, and so forth. And so the problem is of a completely different nature. And maybe the best that we can hope for is not that we have sort of a Newton's laws of biology, but that we can have um, a version of it where instead of being able to predict everything precisely, which is the vision that physics has um, uh, given to the world, um, that instead of that, that maybe we can have a, a science of biology where at least the coarse grain behavior can be quantitatively predicted. So for example, one prediction, quantitative prediction I can make uh, which I presume no one will disagree with, is that I can say, looking across at this biological gathering here of human beings, that within 100 years, everybody in this room will be dead. <laughs> now, I, I put that forth uh, somewhat sarcastically, but indeed, the question behind it is the following, is first of all, to understand aging, the phenomenon of aging, and secondly, to understand the phenomenon of death, and not just mechanistically, but in terms of making it quantitative, to really understand where in the hell does the number 100 years as a sort of order of magnitude for a human lifespan come from? We believe everything is driven at the molecular level. Where in the molecular level, in the genes, in the respiratory enzymes that provide your energy, where in those molecular scales, which are microscopic, for crying out loud, sits 100 years, if this piece of flesh happens to be a human being, happens to be me, whereas if this piece of flesh happened to have been a mouse, and at the level of which we're talking, you cannot tell the difference between a piece of my meat and a piece of mouse meat, why would it be that if it were mouse, it would have been dead, well, I'm six, nearly 67, 63 years ago, 64 years ago, it would have been dead. So can we really predict, can we actually calculate those kinds of numbers? Similarly, uh, can we understand why it is that 
in several more hours, all of us will need to go to bed and sleep. Why is it we need to sleep? And why is it that we need to sleep of the order of eight hours and not one hour or 23 hours? And why is it, again, if we were a mouse, we would have to sleep instead of the conventional eight hours of a human being, um, something like 15 hours. And if the same tissue happened to have been made into an elephant, it would only have to sleep for three or four hours. So that's the kind of question I'm going to be talking about. And um, at the very end, if I, I hope to leave myself time, is to take the same kind of ideas to questions of social organizations like corporations, companies like Google, or the one I will actually focus on is cities. Can we, and in fact asking a sort of conceptual question and then trying to address it, is can we think of a city, can we think of what's San Jose here, as just a, a giant organism which has the same kinds of properties of a, as a biological organism. And very often we use, both for companies and for cities, biological analogs. We talk about, about the metabolism of a city, we talk about the DNA of a company, and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of thing we're going to be talking about. And I hope this contraption works so I can show you some pictures. If not, I'll just keep talking for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> I can do it without visual aids, but better with them. So I don't really need to emphasize that life is almost certainly the most complex and diverse physical system maybe in the universe. And so that's what really is the challenge is that, now you probably, I suspect this isn't gonna work, but we'll see it. Well, it doesn't matter, it's good enough. Because what I'm showing you here is, you can see it's some network, but it's in fact the metabolic chart. You don't have to read anything, you just have to get the idea that it's a highly complex network. And this is a highly simplified version of it. And it is the pathways of interact, chemical interactions that give rise to the production of ATP, which is your currency of energy. Another level of complexity, I, oh, you can't see that at all, so I'm not gonna show it. That's a picture of a forest. You look out anywhere around you in biology, you see highly complex phenomena, highly complex interactions. And one of the questions one would like to understand is, is there any structure and um, organization that can be quantified associated with, the, with that, uh, those phenomena. So one of the things that uh, is, provides a potential window on being able to uh, answer these questions is provided by something called scaling, which is simply answering the question, um, how do various uh, characteristics, in this particular case of organisms, scale with size. So just take the example I talked about, mouse to elephant. How do various attributes of a mammal scale with size? And uh, a priori, um, actually, if you think in terms of natural selection, you would not expect any great degree of correlation between objects of different size because they, uh, each organism and each subsystem of the organism, each organ, each cell, evolved in its own totally unique environmental niche. And so somehow that uh, when you put it all together to make a mouse, how would that be easily related to when you put it all together to make an elephant or a giraffe uh, and so on? And the remarkable thing is that it, now I hope this works, but if not, I'll just say it. Oh, enough, enough that you can get it. I hate PowerPoint is the point. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll tell you why at the end. So, but this is good enough. So what's plotted here is on the y-axis metabolic rate logarithmically. Um, so this is log of metabolic rate and this is log of mass for a bunch of mostly mammals. There are a few birds on here. And what you see on this is a beautiful straight line showing a very simple e example of scaling and it goes indeed, this says mouse, 
and at the top it says elephant. And um, if, it's, uh, if it's a straight line on a log-log plot, it says this is a very simple power law. And the remarkable, one of the remarkable aspects of this is that the slope of this is very close to three quarters. So, but I want to emphasize again that each one of these organisms is unique, evolved uniquely, and yet in terms of the maybe the most complicated physico-chemical process possibly even in the universe, despite that, they all line up in, in a very simple fashion, satisfying, here it is, hopefully that you can read that, um, this very simple equation, the metabolic rate, I call B, is proportional to mass to the three quarters power. So buried in there is also, since it, it scales with an exponent less than one, is an economy of scale. Namely, that if you, uh, if you naively, if you increase by a factor of, um, if you increase the size by a factor of 10,000, you would have expected that the metabolic rate would increase by a factor of 10,000 because you've increased the number of cells by a factor of 10,000. But in fact, the amount of energy needed to sustain the system has only gone up by a factor of 1,000. That's the three quarters. So there's an extraordinary economy of scale as you increase the size of organisms. Now, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say, actually, just on, as an aside, as many people are not aware of this, you probably can't read it. But the y-axis is measured in watts. And if you look where you are, across here, you see you operate at about 100 watts. You operate just sitting here. You use basically the equivalent to a light bulb, which is a real, an extraordinary statement about the fantastic efficiency of uh, your um, of, of, of organisms, and you can actually see that because, by the following. And incidentally, 100 watts, um, if, in case you don't realize, is the 2,000 food calories per day written on the side of your Kellogg's cornflakes. That's what 100 watts is. Much better, frankly, if people wrote down 100 watts, because if you asked how much energy, so that's the amount of energy you require in your sort of normal state, and that's the amount of energy you required when you, when we evolved before we socialized. That is, as, as just organisms in, in uh, equilibrium with every other organism. And each one of these animals found its own equilibrium point according to this law. However, if you ask, now that we are social animals, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end, we've interacted, and we now have a lifestyle which is quite different than the, quote, natural state, so that we have electricity, we have cars, we have heat, we have buildings, and so on. You can ask the question, how much, what is our metabolic rate as social animals? So what does that number change from 100 watts? How, what is the number now? The number now, if you live in the United States, is 11,000 watts. And you can turn this around and ask, how big a mammal are each of us actually operating at? <laughs> and it's bigger than the biggest mammal that has ever existed on this planet, namely the blue whale. So each of us is operating as if we're a mammal far larger than this room, obviously. So it's sort of an extraordinary statement of how we have um, the, the tremendous distortion that we are causing in terms of our interaction with other phenomena, which is sort of obvious, but it's a nice quantitative, illustrative way of saying that. So that's sort of interesting of itself and sort of remarkable, but what's really remarkable is um, if you look at any group of animals, any taxonomic group, insects, fish, crustacea, birds, whatever, and you do the same plots, and because it's such a the, the visuals are so shitty, I'm not gonna bother to show you. They look exactly the same. They look exactly the same uh, with the same three quarters power uh, scaling in the same way, even so down to bacteria. That is, uh, I will just, I'll flash this on so you can see it. That bottom one, a bacteria. Same thing, same slope. And in fact, most recently with some colleagues, we extended this down within cells to look at the scaling, if you go down to mitochondria, 
and to the molecules of the respiratory complex which produce your ATP I mentioned earlier. And if you look at those, you have, um, and I think I did bring it, I will try to throw it, yes, we are. And it's the same, that line, what is on here, these are bacteria, this is a mitochondrion, and these are respiratory enzymes, and this is that same three quarters line, and this scaling continues for 27 orders of magnitude, which is maybe the most remarkable scaling law of, of any. Um, so that's interesting that it covers, that in terms of metabolism, it covers um, pretty much all the way across life. But you can go even further, and if you look at any physiological variable, anything, anything you can think of, you can measure mundane things like uh, heart rates, you can look at profound things like your lifespan, you, you can look at details of diffusion rates across surfaces, um, a hundred of these. I could, if, if, I, if I had a, a good visual projector and uh, we had the time, I could spend the rest of the afternoon showing you a, uh, uh, an enormous plethora of such scaling laws, and they all have a similar kind of structure, and I don't know if this will come out well. No, it won't, so I'm going to leave that, but I will show you this one because it's similar to it. That one will show up. This is the radius of the aorta versus body weight, a very mundane thing. It's just the size of, your, of the uh, aorta, and that scales with a slope of 3 eighths. The one I was going to show you there is heart rate, which decreases as mass to the one quarter. One that is, now I hope these show up. Yes. Yeah. Lifespan, scales as mass to the one quarter. Heart rate, which I tried to show you, decreases as mass to the one quarter. If I multiply them together, what do I get? I get the total number of heartbeats in a lifespan, but the mass to the one quarters cancel out. So what you discover from this is the total number of heartbeats in a lifespan is an approximate invariant. So little things don't live very long, but have very fast heartbeats. Big things live a long time and have short, short uh, have uh, uh, slow heart, heart rates, but in such a way that we all share, roughly speaking, the same number of heartbeats, namely about one and a half billion. And uh, there's nothing fundamental about hearts, but there is something fundamental about the number of times the reaction takes place producing ATP, because that is true of all, one second, of all aerobic metabolism. And uh, that number is an invariant, and I've written it down here, and let me answer the question. And please, uh, interrupt and... I mean, given the, the constant there, I mean, is it, is it dangerous to jog? Ah, let me come back to that. I'm always <laughs> asked that. Uh, if, we have to be kicked out of here by 2 o'clock, so I'm going to be judicious in answering questions. That's, uh, I always get asked that question, and I'll tell you later. What, uh... So um, you can, look, as I say, the only, I'll, I'll just show you one other because it's a, of a slightly different nature, and that is uh, to do with informational system, and that's genome length. That's the length of ge So this is informational system. This is genome length versus mass for a bunch of cells. And there's a lot of variation, but this is a best fit. And the best fit is, gives a slope of one quarter. So what you see emerging from this is this universality of these very simple power laws. And maybe most intriguingly, the emergence of the number four, that this one quarter turns up ubiquitously across uh, almost any phenomenon you look at um, in biology. And uh, part of this work originally was to understand the origin of these scaling laws and um, the, uh, wh where this number four comes from. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that without going into the technical details. Um, let's see what else do I want to tell you. OK, so to summarize, here we have the most complex and diverse system possibly in the universe. Yet, when we look across its, uh, all of its characteristics, they scale in an extraordinarily simple way. And uh, they also have built into them uh, the, um, this idea of uh, economy of scale, that uh, you need less power to, supply, to support 
big things than you do small things per unit mass. The same mass, the same unit of mass requires less power the bigger you are. So this work took place um, in collaboration originally with um, a very distinguished biologist named James Brown um, and, and someone that was then his student, a man named Brian Enquist, who is himself is now a professor who has become well known in his own right. And um, the work was indeed trying to understand the origin of these laws. So I'm going to let me talk for a little bit about what we did. And uh, some of this gets becomes quite technical. And I'm keeping this talk at uh, a sort of scientific American level. I'm not going to talk about any, any technicalities. Anyone interested can certainly come and talk to me afterwards. Um, so the ideas that we developed were based on the following. The first is to recognize that none of, you know, this, these cannot be accidents that you have this extraordinary uh, um, commonality across all scales from the, uh, essentially from the molecular all the way, and I didn't show you data, but all the way to ecosystem levels um, with the same kind of characteristics. So underlying this presumably are a bunch of universal constraints that are independent of the specific system that you look at or the specific so to speak, engineering design that has evolved, whether they be mammals, insects, or birds, and so on. So what we focused on was uh, the question that is true, is, is a problem for any complex system, and that is um, if you have a complex system uh, which is comprised of a very large number of individual agents and individual um, uh, customers, so to speak, how are you going to keep everybody happy? How are you going to sustain all of them? How are you going to supply them? How are you going to um, deliver resources to them? And of course, we know how natural selection has dealt with that. It has evolved a bunch of hierarchical branching network systems in order to take something macroscopic and deliver it down to some microscopic level. It's developed a hierarchy, a hierarchical kind of network system at all scales, at all levels, whether it be the ones that immediately come to mind, like one circuitry system or renal system, respiratory system, neural system, but all the way down to within cells um, or even within mitochondria, where you have um, uh, transport pathways that have these kinds of properties. So, um, so the first thing that we postulated was that at all scales, across all biological phenomena, life is sustained by hierarchical branching network systems. And what these laws are reflecting are the generic mathematical, physical, topological properties of these networks that are universal, that have nothing to do with the specific design. So the ones that we postulated were the following. The first was that these networks be space-filling, that they go everywhere, that they, every cell has, to, for example, has to be fed. So you have to make sure that every capillary in the circuitry system ends up close by a cell so it can feed a cell. So, um, uh, and you can extrapolate that to uh, any other kind of network. So the first is space-filling. The second was the idea uh, and in fact, all of these are really derived conceptually from the natural selection. The idea that as you evolve different species with the same design, natural selection did not reinvent the fundamental units. That is, it didn't reinvent cells every time a new organism, a new species, I should say, evolved from a different species, that it built on the same building blocks so we postulate that the terminal units of these networks are invariant, do not change for a given design. So that, for example, um, a, a mouse, a human being, and a whale all share essentially identical capillaries. So that the size and flow rate in a capillary, whether it be a whale or a mouse or a human being, are the same. In the same way that... Uh, the electrical outlets in this building are essentially identical to the ones in my house, in your houses, 
and people living in Bangladesh, Bombay, or Birmingham. We all have essentially the same electrical outlets. We have the same water faucets. They may look slightly different, but they're all basically the same. <laughs> the same. We use the same uh, PCs. We, uh, even though the networks may be completely different, but the, the terminal unit is an invariant. So uh, just as one does architecturally and in engineering, so natural selection has done the same thing. The last of the kind of principles that we enunciated was the following, was that of the infinitude of possible networks that could have evolved to make the kinds of organisms that we see around us um, that are space filling and have invariant terminal units, the ones that have actually evolved, the ones that have actualized, are ones that in some ways have optimized the system. Um, so as an example, just to keep it simple, um, the, um, just since we were talking about the circulatory system, and, and I must tell you, I'm struggling here not to use this bloody machine, so I'm going to keep talking as long as I can without visual aids, um, is that... Um, Let's talk about the circuitry system, which I've mentioned a couple of times. So that um, if I were to, the, in terms of the circuitry system that we have, and we, I mean all mammals, all mammals, we all share the same circuitry system. The circuitry system that has evolved is the one that has minimized the amount of energy that is required to pump blood around the system. That's the idea. That would be a manifestation of that principle. So that, for example, if I were to make any change in our circuitry system, if I were to arbitrarily double the length of the fourth artery, my heart would have to work harder. But if I were to halve its length, sort of increasing about a half it, it would also have to work harder. So there's a minimization principle. And for those familiar and come out of a physics background, one will recognize this as a, an extraordinarily powerful statement that can be used to derive the equations of motion of the complete network. Because what one does is one writes down the dynamics of flow, in the circuitry case, um, of fluid, of blood, through the entire system, uh, calculates how much energy is being dissipated, how much work the heart has to do, and minimize it with respect to any change in the system. So any change of any length, any change of any radius, uh, any change of branching ratio, any variable that occurs in the problem. And this is basically the methodology is, for those familiar, is one of classical field theory upon which all physics is, is built. And uh, the equations that you get are called the classical Euler-Lagrange equations. And uh, in this way, one can solve for the complete dynamics of a circuitry system, of an arbitrary circuitry system. And um, we have done that. And I'll tell you, uh, without showing you any of the equations, um, I will tell you what the result of that calculation is. But let me say that what this allows, for example, is if you perversely wanted to know what the radius, length, pulse rate, uh, blood flow rate was in the ninth branch of a hippopotamus's circuitry system, there is a formula that has been derived that you put in the numbers, and you get the right answer for the average hippopotamus for that. So you can do that for any of these things. Even so, down to if you want to know how much of the pulse is left in your capillary. You know, when you prick yourself, it just dribbles out. It's obviously not beating. But in fact, there's a little residue of the pulse from your heart. You can calculate that in this theory. It ha turns out to be 0.1% uh, of the wave is left, actually. But you can calculate great detail this, this system. So, you can, so one byproduct of this is that you have a complete description for the average, so to speak, idealized circuitry system. Now, what has this got to do with these scaling laws? So the idea is the following, that um, first of all, in terms of metabolic rate, the 
What is your metabolic rate? Well, it's the amount of oxygen, really, that is being consumed in order to fuel metabolism. In fact, that's the way it is technically measured. Um, and uh, your blood, the whole point of blood, of course, is to have oxygen dissolved in it and deliver it to your cells, so that a, um, a proxy for metabolic rate is, in fact, the blood flow rate through your aorta coming out of your heart, wherever it is here, coming down here. That's a proxy for metabolic rate. and could be used as a measure of metabolic rate. So the volume flow rate in your circuitry system is a proxy for, the, uh, for metabolic rate. And this theory allows one to calculate it in terms of some fundamental parameters. And the theory also allows you, in terms of minimizing the amount of energy your heart has to do, to determine how this changes when I change the whole scale of the system. Meaning, how do I change, when I, if I were to double the whole size, the whole mass of the system, it tells me um, um, how the system responds. And um, it, the way it technically works is that um, uh, the minimization actually tells you that the volume of blood in the network scales linearly with mass. That's what the theory predicts, and indeed, is true um, uh, empirically. And that helps you to relate what goes on in one animal to another animal. And out of that pops this three quarters law. Um, now, um, and, and all the, and in fact, uh, many other things it tells you are the scaling, the complete scaling of the network, and many other phenomena, which I will talk about in one moment. Now, let me just say a few words about the physics of the circuitry system and uh, what, the, what the theory tells us and uh, what happens inside you um, where, as you breathe and you push blood around. So um, when your heart beats, it sends a wave down through the aorta. And your aorta is uh, big enough, um, has evolved to be big enough so that viscous forces dissipative forces play almost no role. So the wave that comes out is roughly speaking a nice sinusoidal wave that, that comes out down through the aorta. It then meets a, a branch point. So some goes down one tube, some goes down another tube. Of course, if it's an arbitrary network, some also bounces back from the branch point. So, and the theory immediately tells you, of course, that's a very bad thing if you had that at every branch point because you'd be pumping against yourself. And um, you can um, solve the equations for what is the minimum amount of energy your heart has to do. And what it amounts to is, of course, that uh, you have no reflections, sort of obvious. Um, and uh, that is called, for those familiar with it, impedance matching. And that's exactly the same way, of course, electricity is sent across the country um, uh, in order to minimize losses uh, when, uh, in terms of transmission. And you have evolved to do exactly the same thing in terms of your network. And you can ask, what is the constraint that that leads to? And that constraint uh, leads to something called area-preserving branching, where the cross-sectional area of a parent branch is the sum of the cross-sections of the daughter branches, which is indeed, if you do the measurements, that's indeed true. So, uh, and, and if, so when you put that into the minimization equations, uh, that plays a crucial role in getting to this three quarters. And I'll return to that again in one moment. But um, as the as, as you go down through the network, of course, tubes get narrower and narrower and ultimately become so narrow that um, blood uh, starts to, I mean, sorry, the, the flow starts to be dissipated and the wave starts to be dissipated due to viscosity. And um, that means that the whole structure of your blood flow is continuously changing from the aorta all the way down through the capillaries in such a way that the blood almost stops at the capillaries so that you can get efficient diffusion to cells. And the theory tells you exactly how that works. But there's a very interesting consequence from that. And that is the following, that you could imagine 
that uh, the shrinking down the size of the animal, shrinking down the aorta in a predictive way, where the aorta becomes so small itself that it can no longer support a pulse wave. Okay, the dissipative forces are so strong that when the heart pumps, the wave is immediately damped in the aorta. And uh, so you would have, in that case, have an animal with a beating heart but no pulse. And in that instance, you have a highly inefficient system because um, in that system, you have dissipation of energy due to viscous forces in every single branch of the network, whereas in you, in us, where you have this impedance matching, almost no work is being done in pushing the uh, blood down through the major part of your arteries. And uh, that gives rise to a tremendous, efficient, uh, tremendous efficiency. And indeed, if you recalculate the metabolic rate, it uh, turns out that it's uh, no longer this three quarters power. It's, um, it goes approximately linearly with mass. And so there is no economy of scale associated with it, not surprisingly. And indeed, this allows one to derive an equation for the smallest mammal. Namely, the mammal that is the smallest is the one that can least support, can support at least some wave and some impedance matching at least the first couple of branches. And if you do the calculation, you discover that indeed the smallest mammal should be of the order of one gram, which is what it is. So there's lots of things like that that one can um, predict. Um, <coughs> pardon me. And um, uh, so what I'd like to do now is tell you a couple of other things about that theory and talk in particular about growth. I want to talk about growth, and I'm going to finish up by using that as a segue into talking about social organizations. But um, you won't see this, but I just flashed this on to, as a table of a whole bunch of things. There's tables and tables of things that you can predict in this theory for all sorts of curious things like oxygen affinity of the blood, um, the, uh, uh, the, the total resistance of the network, and so on and so forth, all of which have been measured and which are, agree with the uh, theory. And one can do this not just for the circulatory system, the respiratory system. One can do it for trees and plants. That's very important because plants do not have a pulsatile flow, yet the same principle is applied it's got a completely different design, completely different mechanical design. It's a bunch of fiber bundles rather than a bunch of tubes. And uh, that um, uh, the calculation is completely different. The whole setup of the problem is different, but it's based on the same principles. And it gives um, the same kind of excellent agreement with data. Um, so um, I want to talk just briefly before talking about growth about um, one interesting prediction, and that is the following. If you, first of all, if you ask where, uh, where does this greater efficiency come from, um, in the, in the, in the uh, calculation, what it comes from is that the bigger the network, turns out the smaller the resistance, because what, what the theory shows is that even though you have um, uh, the resistance goes up as you make a bigger network. The number of outlets increases faster uh, than the increase in, in that resistance, so that the total resistance goes down. And it goes down in a very interesting way. It goes down in a way that the theory predicts that blood pressure should be an invariant. So the blood pressure of a shrew that sits on the palm of my hand should be the same as the blood pressure of a whale that's bigger than this room, which is indeed the case. But the, um, the, the point of the efficiency, remember, was so it comes out of the dynamics of the network. One of its predictions is that the metabolic rate should go as mass of the three quarters, which, as I said before earlier, is reflective of, a, of an economy of scale. And the economy of scale can be parameterized by thinking of the metabolic rate per cell, per unit mass, which if it goes, if the metabolic rate goes as mass to the three quarters, the cellular metabolic rate must decrease as mass to the one quarter. Okay, so uh, 
which is surprising because cells are the same across all mammals, and yet, in vivo, they're behaving differently in a, a small organism than in a large one, and from this theoretical viewpoint, it's because of the hegemony of the network. So that gives rise to a very interesting prediction, that if I remove the network, cells that were behaving differently in a mouse than in an elephant should now behave the same. So I remove the network, they all behave the same. So I hope you can see this. So here's a picture of the metabolic rate of a cell versus the mass of the host. And here's where, what the prediction is in vivo. This is mass to the minus one quarter. Here's the prediction in vitro when you remove them and cultivate them. And this is a completely quantitative theory. It tells you, you can't read it there, what value this should come to and what the slope of this is and so on and so forth. And um, I will just flash on data, which you probably can't see, but uh, to show you, there it is. There's the data. And this, you can't see, these are a bunch of points in vivo. And this is the data in vitro. And you can see it, it's in reasonably good agreement with the, uh, um, uh, with the prediction. Now let me talk a little bit about growth, because growth is a scaling phenomenon. And how does it occur? How do you understand it in this theory? Well, you understand it um, in terms of the following, that um, the network is there to deliver resources to cells. And what happens to those resources? And this is true of any organization. Um, some goes towards maintenance, and some goes towards productions of new cells, new stuff, growth. So you can write that down. You can write that equation down. And maintenance, incidentally, also includes not just maintaining what is there, but replacing cells that die. I don't know if this will come out as an Yeah, there we are. So what does that say? I've boiled it down to its simplest possible form. <clears throat> the incoming metabolic rate divides itself into maintenance, the number of cells that are there times the metabolic rate of each cell, plus the energy needed to create a cell times the rate at which you create them. Now, the number of cells is just linearly related to the uh, total mass. Number of cells is proportional to the total of mass. So you can rewrite this as a very simple differential equation for the mass, the total mass of the organism as a function of time. And uh, I don't, there it is there. It's a very simple equation. And that's, that equation can be solved analytically. And from that, one can, um, uh, one derives um, a very nice sigmoidal curve for growth. And I don't know if you'll see this either, but I'm going to flash on a bunch of data. Uh, the, this is a hen, a cow, I think that's a guppy, that's a guppy, and that is a guinea pig. So various animals, I could have chosen lots of others. And there's a bunch of data on this. And these lines are the absolute predictions of the theory based on universal parameters like the average mass of a cell, the average energy needed to create a cell, and so on. And one can rewrite this in a very beautiful way, actually. Where do I have it here? One can re-express this in a very beautiful way, and it's sad that you can't see it all. But by, well, this is what the theory tells you to do. And I'm going to read it, because you can't see it. That on the y-axis here is plotted the mass at age t relative to the mature mass. Plotted along the x-axis is this Byzantine variable. T is age, m is mature mass, a is a parameter, universal parameter determined by the theory in terms of fundamental biological constants. And there's a small correction here due to the birth mass. But this is what the theory says. It says that if you plot data this way, everybody grows in the same way, no matter whether they're an insect, a fish, a human being, or whatever. You name it, a crustacean, anything. And this is the data taken from a myriad different uh, organisms. And uh, 
Regardless of the theory, it's an extraordinary way of seeing the wonderful unity of life. We all grow in the same way. And one can do this similar kind of, uh, of uh, uh, analysis for other kinds of phenomena like mortality and like uh, evolution, even evolution itself, and see that if you rescale everything, everybody is evolving at the same rate, everybody's growing at the same rate, and so on. And in the last few minutes, because I didn't leave myself time. Um, oh, let me just say one thing about growth. I just want to add one other thing, actually, about growth. Uh, one of the interesting offshoots of that is not just understanding growth itself, but to ask questions that are really interesting and challenging about things like growth of cancer. Growth of cancer is, of course, a very important problem. But it also is very challenging to analyze because it's the interface of two networks. How does uh, a, a something growing on a host actually develop relative to taking resources from the host? And asking questions like, what is the difference between growing a tumor inside you and growing a fetus inside you? What, why is one, what distinguishes something healthy from something that is um, presumably unhealthy, and one can start to address those kinds of questions, and I don't have time to go into them. What I'm going to do in the remaining five minutes, maybe, is I would like to talk very quickly about extending this idea to social organizations. So we have a theory in biology, and I've barely scratched the surface in showing you, uh, that can understand a myriad kind of phenomena. Um, in a quantitative way based on this idea of properties of networks, but the window onto it were these scaling laws, and the question is, can one take the same paradigm and apply them in social organizations? And the, uh, this is very recent work, and the answer is yes, and the question to be asked is, in what sense are social organizations the same as and different from uh, biological organizations. And the, the data that we focused on was data for cities because getting data for corporations was extraordinarily difficult and very costly, whereas data for cities is to, to a large extent open and available. And I, uh, this collaboration, uh, the previous collaboration was with physicists and chemists, biochemists and so on. This collaboration was with also some other physicists, mathematicians, but anthropologists, economists, urban geographers, and the like. And one of the major tasks was to ask the question, are there scaling laws of cities? What do scaling laws tell you? What did, what did we learn in biology? Um, just superficially, without knowing the theory, what we learned is that an elephant is, in fact, a blown-up gorilla, which is a blown-up human being, which is a blown-up mouse. To all intents and purposes, they may look very different, but they are, in fact, non-linearly scaled up versions of one another in terms of their internal organization and dynamics. And the question is, is there something similar about cities? Is New York just a scaled up San Jose, which is a scaled up Santa Fe, even though they look completely different? May not be, but that the data will tell. Unfortunately, I won't be able to show you the, much of the data, but I'm going to tell you the answer. I will show you one just to give you a sense of, doesn't matter what I'm plotting for the moment, I'm going to come back to this, but just to give you a sense of the kinds of data, I'll tell you what is plotted there in a moment. But to show you that, yes, for all, we looked at a myriad variables from infrastructural things like number of gas stations, surfaces of roads, um, uh, total length of electrical cables, et cetera, et cetera, infrastructural things. Then we looked at a bunch of, now infrastructural things are like biology. They're like the networks I talked about. And indeed, they express an economy of scale. You need less roads per capita in a bigger city, less gas stations per capita. But then we looked at social phenomena, which are unique to organization such as this. That is, the fact that people interact and that 10,000 years ago, human beings brought some new dynamic to the planet, maybe even to the universe, by forming communities. Uh, and so what did we look at? We looked at things like wages. 
We looked at things like number of patents produced. We looked at things like number of colleges, number of hospitals, number of doctors, number of police, number of crimes, number of diseases, all of these phenomena. And we discovered that yes, indeed, they scale, and this is one of them. This happens to be wages, and this happens to be number of super creators, people like you, it's a, a sociology term, but number of these, and what we discovered was that unlike anything in biology, these do not scale with sublinear, like three quarters exponent, less than one, they scale with superlinear exponents, uh, exponents that are greater than one. And what is remarkable is that all of the exponents for all of these phenomena, whether they be police, taxes, wages, number of patents, number of crimes, number of diseases, all scale in the same way. Namely, all with a universal exponent around 1.15, that somehow all of these social phenomena, many of which one thinks of as independent, all scale in a very similar way. That is, you have more, the bigger you are, you have more wages per capita, but you also have more crime per capita. But in a systematic way, and we looked at cities across the United States, across Europe, across China, and it's the same everywhere. It's sort of extraordinary. Um, now, um, one of the things that comes out of this, can I take a couple of minutes, or should I, are we gonna be murdered? Am I gonna be murdered? Maybe I should stop. So let me just say, I'll say just one word and then stop. And that is what we asked from this was to, first of all, what is the theory behind it? And the, the major thing that we have done is ask, what are the consequences of this? And the two major consequences, and I'm just going to sum it up in the last sentence, are one, that inevitably the bigger you are, unlike biology, the bigger you are, the slower the pace of life, your heart rate decreases, your lifespan is longer, and so on. In social organizations, the bigger you are, cities in particular, the faster life is in a predictable way, including even things like the speed at which you walk, which I would show you data. Um, and then ask this question of growth. How do we get around the fact that we have sigmoidal growth that stops, which you cannot have in a social our whole system is based on continuous growth. And um, it turns out if superlinear behavior, you have open growth. However, what it tells you is that inevitably, you can only go on growing forever if you continue to innovate. You have to continuously change the parameters of the equations to give those superlinear scalings. And you have to innovate in a regular way which is good because that's what we believe. But the thing that was astonishing was that it's not actually regular. You inevitably, in a predictable way, have to innovate in an accelerating fashion. That is, the time between major innovations has to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And undoubtedly, that if that is true for organizations, it brings up, uh, social organizations, it brings up the question of sustainability. And somehow buried in that, which is part of our next work, is to take this to companies, understand companies, and to ask, therefore, um, uh, can we understand why it is that uh, uh, there's a lifespan of a company? And what does a company mean? And why it is that there isn't a Pan Am and a TWA, and in 50 years, there may not be an eBay and a Google? and to understand that. And then maybe something else may replace it, maybe not. And what is the dynamic that you need to do it? So anyway, I'm sorry, sorry for the uh, thing and I'll finish there.